if I'm praying today that you fell in love with Jesus, that Jesus is also your Lord, that he is your friend, that he is your comforter, that he is your keeper. That would make Jesus be our Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Listen, if you believe Jesus still got all power, if you're putting all your trust in him, smile at somebody and tell them it's still Jesus' time. It's still Jesus' time. Oh, thank you, Jesus. If you would be seated with me and we'll be as brief as the Holy Ghost allow. Open your Bibles to the book of Galatians, chapter number 4, uh, verses 1 through verse number 11, if it be Jesus' will. Again, that's Galatians, chapter number 4, verses 1 through 11, in the mighty name of Jesus. The Bible said his name alone is excellent, that he is worthy of not some of the praise, a part of the praise, but, but all of the praise. If there be any good deed, anything praiseworthy, if anything ever happened good in your life, it had to be Jesus. If there was any joy or any peace, Jesus did it. If there was any doors opened or any moves made, Jesus did it. He has been good to you. And for that, he deserves all the glory and all the praise. Uh, Galatians chapter 4, if you're there, shout thank you, Jesus. And the Bible reads, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Verse 8, how be it then? When ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to weak and beggarly elements where unto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Thank you, Jesus. If you would turn to someone near to you and just tell them, A life in Jesus. A life in Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It occurs to me uh, that, uh, that Jesus has offered us something uh, and made it available to everyone that there has to be a difference in Jesus than being outside of Jesus because Jesus died for the whole world. But the whole world did not receive Jesus. Jesus said, the thief cometh not, John 10 and 10, but to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That what he offers to us uh, is a whole nother life. That living in Jesus means living in a whole uh, nother level. The Bible says, if any man therefore be in Christ, he is a new creation and former things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. That we understand that when we have now affiliation with Jesus, it now allows us to experience life in a whole new level. Paul said, now Christ is our life. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But not I that live, but Christ that liveth in me. That we're not called to experience life formally. And he uses this, he uses reference of being a child and being an adult. Because it's the same Paul who says in the book of Corinthians, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought as a child, I behaved as a child. But when I became a man, I put away those childish things. He's talking about now uh, moving into a whole nother level of maturity or understanding. So he said, now uh, that we have the mind of Jesus, now that I know I've been set free, now that I know I am washed by the blood of the Lamb, I'm called to live in a whole nother level of maturity. 
that our life is now uh, framed not according to what men say, but the Bible said it's framed according to the word of God. That means this. That means I don't do uh, what I do because men say it. I do what I do because I'm in love with Jesus. I live like I live because I love him. I talk like I talk because I love him. I do what I do because I love him. That when we experience a life in Jesus, and here's why most people uh, don't want a life in Jesus, because they don't understand that it's not like what they formerly used to know, that life in Jesus means to live in another level. On, the Bible said that we've now entered into heavenly Jerusalem, yeah. into a host of innumerable angels, that life in Jesus is called to mean experiencing life on a whole another level, that you do not live where the thief lives, but you live where only God can keep you, and that's in safety. I'm saying this to us because even though we have the option, even though they, we have the availability, even though uh, Jesus has set a door, the Bible said that no man can shut. Just because we have the option, just because it's available, just because he's already finished it, doesn't mean that we'll receive it. That what you found out or what we rather we've learned is that uh, Jesus does not make you take the stuff that he's given, even though it's free. Amen. All his gifts are freely given, but they're also freely received. Amen. That means that even though he gave them free, you got to receive them because you want them. Yeah. That he's offered us peace yeah. that passes all understanding. Yeah. But he doesn't force that peace on you. On, you got to want the peace of Jesus, Jesus. which passes all understanding. Yeah. The Bible records his joy and said his joy is unspeakable. But he doesn't force that kind of joy on you. He don't just make you walk in his joy. You have to desire the joy of Jesus. You have to want this joy. And if you want the joy, then the joy is free for you. The Bible said it's to everyone that believes. It. It's free for you. It's to everyone that receives it. Now, in application of that, that means that, uh, that all that Jesus gave, uh, all that he died for, uh, everything he promised, everything that he has said, his, his promises, a yea and amen, they're all available to me because Jesus said. Amen, that's right. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth. Yes. And this truth shall make you free. Here's, a, here's the thing, so now that we have a choice, and, and I find myself, even when I'm, not, uh, when I'm not watching myself, I find myself being so uh, committed to what I'm in because here's, here's, here's the real problem. Sometimes I'm so committed to where I'm in, I don't know where it is Jesus is trying to take me. I am so comfortable. I am so complacent. I am so okay with whatever it is I'm living in. I don't realize that Jesus wants me on a whole nother level. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So there's some things that I am comfortable in because I'm comfortable in that place. Because I'm comfortable in that place even though the possibility that Jesus has offered me, afforded me, is better than what I'm living in, but I don't know it until I try it. Okay, Jesus said it's the nature of man that if you, if you present them with the new wine straight away, they'll say the old wine is better. It is the nature. It is, the, it is just the way we're made up. You think what you got is the best. You don't know what they got. You think your stuff is the best one, but you ain't tried all of them. It's because it's how we're made up. Jesus said this straight away. Uh, and you offer somebody the new wine, the first thing they're going to tell you is that the old wine is better because they're already comfortable complacent with the old wine. It's only when they taste the new wine. Amen. It's only when they try the new wine yes. that they begin to understand that Jesus has offered them a something exceptional. Yes. Thank you, okay, in Mark 11, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. And learn of me, for I am meek and lowly, and you shall find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, 
and my burden is light. So now Jesus is even saying himself that he's offered us this opportunity that if ever you just try him, you'll find out that living in his life is living a better life. If you'll find him, you'll find out that he's given life and then that more abundantly. If you'll try him, you'll find out his yoke is easy. His burden is light. I say that because uh, the reason why any, uh, uh, anyone would be a slow uh, to follow a Jesus life or not uh, receptive to receive it is because it sometimes it doesn't look as good as Jesus says it should be. Amen. I can tell you why. Because he has poor representation. Amen. Say again. Because we are ambassadors of Christ. Amen. Because you are the salt of the earth. A city set upon a hill. Because men have to look at you to then see his good work. Amen. But if you don't make the work look good, then they don't know that our God is good. Right. Let me say it to you better that because we're called to live an accelerated life and in this world there's tribulation, there's heaviness, there's hardship. You got Jesus. That even though there's tribulation, there's heaviness, there's hardship, there's all kind of trouble. And people have a whole lot of room to complain. There's a sad stories all over. But you got Jesus. And so, therefore, if you're called to live in another life that is not the norm, the norm is to be heavy. But Jesus said, try my yoke. My yoke is easy. Thank you, Jesus. That we are accustomed naturally and comfortable with living in bondage. That we are naturally affiliated with heaviness and hardship. We understand that better than we know joy. You know trouble more than you know peace. Because you're made to deal with it. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. I have already overcome this world. The problem with uh, people knowing Jesus and understanding what Jesus has promised and who Jesus is, is that until they see who Jesus is, they can't believe who Jesus is. And we don't show them who Jesus really is. That's why Paul said in order for them to see who Jesus really is, you got to come out of conformity with the world. You can't be heavy like they heavy because Jesus' yoke is easy. You can't be weary like they're weary because Jesus will give you rest. You can't be in trouble every time they're in trouble because our God is a very present help in time of trouble. Because the representation is often because we become so affiliated with heaviness and hardship because we understand naturally what it is to live on this level. And so there's some things that are in uh, our living, uh, just like he said here in Galatians chapter 4, by law. So when Jesus died, he did not take the form of angels. But the Bible said he took the form of a man. That he was touched with the feeling of our infirmities. That he understands exactly what it means to go through living in this flesh. That under the law, the law of living, the law of life, that he's subject, uh, you're subject in the flesh to have to deal with some stuff. And so Jesus made sure that he was subject to everything you're subject to. If you're in the flesh, you'll be sad sometimes. You got to deal with all this emotional stuff. That's in the flesh. If you're in the flesh, you got to deal with other people in the flesh. That's, that's what comes with being in the flesh. But then Jesus did something so remarkable. That on a hill called Calvary, yes. he carried the old rugged cross. And the Bible says that he had on his cross all of our iniquities, all of our transgressions, all of our infirmities. Then Jesus says to you and I, I want you to come after me. But first I need you to deny yourself. And then take up your cross. And I'm going to show you life on this other level. That, there, that uh, simply to be uh, life on the normal level, I'll give it to you another way. I don't want to be too long with it, but I want to make sure you understand Jesus uh, is life on another level. That we are first Adam, natural. Amen. The Bible said the first Adam was natural. He was a man, and that's... What we first are, your first natural. So everybody who is alive is first natural. 
Everybody who's alive has the law of whatever comes with the first Adam, that any man born of a woman shall surely die. That's with the first Adam. Amen. That the wages of sin is death. All that comes under the blood of the first Adam. That, that man shall live by the sweat of his brow. All that comes from the first Adam. That women shall go through the turmoil of labor. All that is under the first Adam. But then the Bible called Jesus the last Adam. And the last Adam is a quickening spirit. So the last Adam comes and offers you a whole nother area to enter into. The first Adam just flesh. But the last Adam is a spirit. The first Adam is limited by time. But the last Adam lives in grace. Yes. Thank you, I guess my question for you would be this. It's, it's probably harder, your living, I mean, is harder than what it should be. But I guess my real question for you would be, is it harder than you like it? There has to be a certain amount of uh, a surrender in order for Jesus to move in and then claim lordship in that area. I mean, uh, so you can have a place where you don't like it, but you're not really tired of it. Have you ever been going through something you didn't like, but you wasn't ready to give up yet? Didn't feel good, uh, didn't work good, but you weren't ready to surrender it just yet. So you toil with it, you pull with it, you fight with it, but that's where Jesus steps in. Because we can cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. Can you imagine if someone seen you living in Jesus, that you put on the Lord Jesus Christ and made no provision for the flesh? If someone actually seen you living on this whole other level, well, yeah, you got trouble, but you don't have any fear because you're made perfect in love. Amen. Well, you can speak boldly and say, I understand that the world is falling apart, but it shall not come nigh me. Or are there any Jesus people in this place? Because I made the Lord who is my refuge and the most high my habitation. I'm living life in Jesus. And life in Jesus means there's some things that you do not have to touch. See, that's what it really means. He said that he's afraid that they would go back in weak and beggarly ways of living uh, where uh, they desire again to be in bondage, the old stuff. And, and the old stuff means it's simply that you had to take everything you get. Uh, they got an old saying, beggars can't be choosers. Amen. It simply meant that all you were looking for was something to help, but you would have to take whatever you got. See, that's what it means to be a beggar. You might need five, but get two, but you'll take the two because you got to take whatever you get. And so we become accustomed to this kind of living because we don't understand that in Jesus, he meets all need. In Jesus, all things are already finished in him. And we go back again sometime grasping, looking for stuff. And then we follow Jesus or know Jesus, but then uh, live under him as if we are a beggar. As if we don't know any better. But it's funny how Jesus proclaims us to be and who we sometimes pretend to be are not the same things. Jesus said in Matthew uh, 7 and 7, ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be open unto you. Listen to verse 8. This is going to blow your mind. Because everyone who asketh, receive it. And everyone who seeketh shall find. And all that knocketh on the door. Oh, my Jesus, let me say it to you one more time. Now, now, this is what Jesus said. Everybody who knocks, he opens. Everybody who seeks him, finds him. This ain't no special something for special people on a special day. See, that's what didn't mess your mind up. You ain't got to be in a special area, in a special sunrise. Everybody who calls on the name of Jesus. He is so good and his yoke is so easy. That it is so easy that sometimes you can't just 
continue to be mad at the devil, at some point you got to be mad at yourself. It's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sometimes you just got to be mad at yourself. Now all kind of things are being offered to you. Because Jesus talking doesn't make the devil stop talking. But now you have a choice of what you receive. See, when I was a beggar, when I was a child, I had to take whatever you give me. But now that I'm a grown man, I, I want what I want. You can't just give me anything because I know what I'm looking for. And so there's some things now I can say no to. There's some things I can tell you even though you give it, I don't want it. There's some things I can send back and return. Because I know what I'm looking for. That when we live a life that does not look like, I mean, we live a life that we have Jesus, but we live it weak and beggarly. That we have not been given the spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. When we live it weak and beggarly, and that's sometimes how you feel, just weak. What am I going to do? Where is the answer? We're no longer children tossed to and fro. That you got to have your soul anchored. Amen. That Jesus has tabernacled with me. That I have hooked up with the most high God. And that all power is in his hands. Not only does Jesus say, uh, you talk about in power, let me give you this one. Not only does Jesus say, I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you. But he said, behold, if you look again, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth, I'll bind in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth, I'll loose in heaven. Amen. I'm giving you power over all the power of the enemy. It sounds good. Affirmations are good. All this scripture and word is good. But until it, uh, until it reflects in your living, until your living is good, Amen. until you got good joy, yeah, yeah, yeah. until you reside in good peace, even though it's good in Jesus, it's not good for you. Not until you can receive it. Amen. See, Paul lays it out pretty clearly. He says, now, when you're a child, uh, the child does not differ from a servant while he's under tutors. Because he got somebody else telling him what to do, just like the servant got somebody else telling him what to do until he gets old enough to where he knows what to do. Let me say it again. Does that make sense to you? As long as he's in a position where he has to have somebody telling him what to do, then he's not in a position where he knows what to do, and he looks just like the servant. Amen. Amen. Even though he's already Lord of all. That everything has to work for him, but if he don't know how to make it work, then it's no good to him. Amen. Everybody there has to follow his orders. Yes. But until he knows what orders to give, it doesn't mean anything to him. Amen. That he has the words to make everybody move. But if he don't know how to use it, then nobody moves according to his word. So it looks as if even though he's been promised something else, even though he's been, uh, even though he's been uh, chosen and purposed for something else, he looks the same as everyone else until he understands who he is. That all the tutors uh, would train uh, the Lord of the house to do is understand his roles and his responsibilities. To understand what it means to be the master. Amen. To teach him uh, how it was to hold itself and keep itself because he was called for a whole nother kind of living. That even though you live with them, you're not called to live like them. That's what he's trained to understand. Amen. That even though y'all all eat together, you're called to live on another level because the blood that you have received. Oh, y'all not hearing what I'm saying? That they would teach, uh, they would teach that child that it's not because of who they are necessarily. It's not just because of them. It's because the blood they got is better. Amen. It's because they received better blood. And they ain't got nothing to do with it. This blood was passed down to them. And all they got to do is receive it and know what they're working with. 
They don't got to make themselves king. They were born that way by way of the blood transfer. And because they received the blood, the promise comes with the blood. So he simply, uh, the tutor now simply job is to convince him that uh, they don't have to make him king. He is king. He just has to know who he is. They don't have to make him king. He is king. They just waiting for him to start acting like a king. And as soon as he act like what the blood has already declared him to be, then he won't do what they say. They'll do what he says. But whenever you get comfortable, and even now, uh, you'll get comfortable with a certain portion, a certain time in your life where it wasn't that bad, and you'll accept something uh, not quite the glory of God. You'll accept something a little bit off just because it ain't that bad. Do you know the devil never presents to you a complete untruth? Amen. Even though Jesus said, John 8, the father of lies. But he never complete, uh, completely lies to you. He always lies, but cover it with the truth so it's not really a total lie. Because that's the best way to lie. That's the way to make it believable. Nobody would believe an outrageous lie, but if the lie sounds reasonable, you can convince yourself that you can believe it. You can convince yourself that uh, that it's okay to accept it and receive it. And when Jesus went and talked to the Pharisees and he told them, he said, your father, your father, the devil, he's a liar since the beginning, his word, will you obey? They said, listen, we're not in bondage to any man. Amen. We're Abraham's seed. And Jesus said, uh, if you're Abraham's seed, oh, you would love me. <laughs> if you understood what was in the blood, you would be glad to see me show up. That because uh, even though they understood uh, their heredity, they understood that the blood uh, that they received was from Father Abraham, and they understood the promise was on Abraham and in the blood, but they didn't know what came with the blood with the promise, so they didn't know what to do with it. Amen. So even though they had the promise over their lives, they were still allowing the enemy Amen. to manipulate them. They were still living weak and beggarly. From misery to misery and sadness to sadness. Can you imagine having Jesus and having no joy? I'll let you think about that. Can you imagine knowing Jesus but not having any peace? Can you imagine living in Jesus but never having his victory? My question to you is if you got Jesus, how could the devil ever win? The Bible said, if ever you think that the devil's winning, Jesus made an open showing of the devil on Calvary Hill, uh, leaving a blood stain on the cross, proving that he triumphed over principalities and powers. Amen. That the devil cannot win. Yes. Yes. That he's given you the ability to tread over serpents, that the devil cannot win. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible said that when we... That the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for the tearing down of strongholds. Well, fighting the spiritual weakness in high places, all these things. But it never once mentioned really fighting the devil. Which part of this energy should we be conserving for fighting the devil? See, there's a reason why it never appoints us to fight with the devil. It never once appointed you as a person to fight with the devil because when you understand who you are uh, you don't have to fight with anyone who you have power over and the Bible says because we have power over all the power of the enemy we don't have to struggle with the devil because no matter what he does we've been given all power we don't struggle with the devil that's the reason why you can see uh, if you stepped out here right now and there was a six-year-old standing outside the door, he got his fist balled up big and bad and said, come on, I've been waiting on you. There's a reason why you wouldn't engage him in fighting because it'd be a ridiculous waste of your time. Because you'll walk past and say, there's no need in me fighting six-year-olds because can't no six-year-old beat me. 
because you understand that your strength is more than his strength. So even though he, even if he ain't acting like it, even if he don't know it, there's some things you can release because you know he can't do what he's saying he can do. Amen. That he might can fight some people, but he ain't big enough to beat you. He ain't strong enough or wise enough to beat you. That you've been endued with power from on high. That there's, there's some things he can't get around. That you got this shield of faith. That you got the helmet of salvation. That the devil cannot even uh, be given credit for this level of quality of life that we're living because we've allowed ourselves to live it uh, just by sheer habit. He said that they are given uh, times, and months, dates, and years. He was telling them not so much just that they're into the holidays and into the tradition, but they're into doing things just like how they always did things. And so whenever uh, they receive something spiritually, they still go back to living naturally. So after they got some, some new knowledge to live on a new level, they go back to living the old level, the old way. And he said, uh, um, my fear is that you like living in bondage. My fear is that begging ain't so bad for you. You've gotten used to it. And so people actually make you believe that you serve a God that requires that you beg him. But Jesus never once said beg him. All you got to do is ask him. Amen. Jesus said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, it shall be given unto you. Amen. Ask and it shall be given. Yes. This is not a begging God. This is a free giving God. This is a loving God. That the things that we made up that make it seem like it's hard to live with him it's only because that we try to imitate life uh, without him as if we're with him. Because when we're with him, the Bible said, if you just would seek him, you do not want any good thing. Amen. That's just a fancy way of saying anybody who's with Jesus is satisfied. Yes. That you can't be with him and be dissatisfied because that's what he specializes in. Thank you, Jesus. That he is all in all. He leaves you satisfied. David said, I mess around and started following him and my cup runs over. Amen. He leaves me satisfied. Amen. Goodness and mercy, they just follow me. Amen. He ain't talking about building nothing or fighting nothing. All he's doing is following Jesus. Amen. You start going after Jesus and things will just start happening. Amen. His joke is easy. Jesus doesn't say you have to learn how to plow. He just said, take my yoke. My yoke is easy. His burden is light. That it gets harder and harder for us because uh, we get used to living under a yoke that's not easy. And so struggle becomes a way of life. That you got Jesus and you believe that because uh, it said that you'll go through some stuff, you think that means you're supposed to struggle with some stuff, and I disagree with you. I disagree with you because in the world there is tribulation. That means you'll go through some stuff. But Jesus said, don't worry about it. You can be glad about it. I already overcome some stuff. So the stuff that you're supposed to go through, you ain't got to go through. All you do is jump on the other side with Jesus. Jesus handles your stuff. He deals with your stuff. He, he, he takes care of your stuff. It gets harder and harder because we get more comfortable and then we're not willing yet to surrender or submit. Yes, in certain areas. There's some areas where you do it easy, so easy that you don't even think about it. But then there's other areas where there's resistance. Yes. Amen. And wherever there's resistance, then uh, grace has to resist. Not that he wants to, but he resisted pride. And give it grace to the humble. Amen. It's a matter of fact thing. It's just he can't, he can't give you anything that you're not open to receive. And so therefore, even though he wants to, he can't. Therefore, even though it is easy, it's not easy for you because you're not trying his yoke. Because you're not allowing him to do the thing that should come easy in your life. So now you got troubles like everybody else got troubles. But Jesus affords us a whole different way of living with our troubles. You say, oh, I got these troubles. I got things. You don't even understand. Of course, you don't understand. Who got the bills I got and the troubles I got and the pains I got? Woe unto me. Dark clouds follow me. Thunderstorms fall on my head. I, have, uh, I don't have any good thing to talk about. 
See, but we have this relationship with Jesus, and Jesus begins to expand to his apostles the relationship in Mark chapter 6. He says, understand, I understand how everybody else pray. I understand what everybody else is looking for, but you got to understand that the Father already knows uh, that you have need of all these things. You ain't got to go around and act needy because he's already hooked up with you. You ain't got to go around and act like a beggar because he already knows what you have need of. So seek ye first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. It's just like David said, if ever you go after Jesus, you'll watch this stuff just pack you up. Peace will just follow you. Joy will just follow you. We have to believe Jesus works in our life to then uh, work with or rather cooperate with his will. Did you believe that Jesus gives peace? If you really believe that and you, you believe that Jesus can give you peace, then surrender to him all your trouble. If you believe that Jesus can give you joy, then everything that's been worrying you, give it to Jesus. If you surrender all you got to him, you'll find out that his level of living will blow your mind. That you can't even comprehend the thing that God has planned. Oh, my Jesus. For them that love him. But because you only want to live a little, you only get to walk in this joy a little, and then you walk in misery a lot. You mean to tell me you expect for me to believe that the, that the prominent thing in your life is the one time you smile and I got to see you 20 times frowning and you don't understand why I think that you're a sad person and not a happy person. Why I think that you have sorrow and no joy. Why I see you in degradation but never in peace. But you want me to understand through your uh, heavy wisdom and understanding that somehow even though you only smile a tenth of the time, even though you only have joy one sixteenth of the time, I should understand that that's who you are. That joy overcomes you. Shouldn't uh, the thing that overcomes you uh, be the thing that dominates your living? Shouldn't the prominent thing, I mean, who you are, you're a whole lot of things, but uh, the thing that you are the most is the thing that overcomes uh, most of your living. Jesus said, out the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That when something gets inside of you uh, and you can't help it, it gets so big, it's got to come out. After a while, you just can't help yourself. After a while, you just can't help yourself. And so what happens uh, to us is that we allow other things to uh, gain prominence, gain abundance, gain uh, game, gain a, a, a significant position in our lives and so we become something else. We live something else and life is just way too hard for people who know how good Jesus is. Life is just way too hard for people to know how easy Jesus' yoke is because we've tried his yoke but then there's some time where we simply choose something else. Make no doubt about it, Jesus is a choice that you choose him. That you have to choose life. That there's always an option to choose something else. And there's some people around in the world and they're going to be heavy and they're going to be degraded. But I'm choosing to walk with Jesus. There's some people who are going to live in trouble and they're going to talk trouble and they're going to walk in trouble. But I'm choosing to walk in Jesus. There's some people who are going to talk bad and live bad and act bad. But I'm choosing to live for Jesus. I don't believe that it happened by happenstance. Let me make a bold declaration unto you. I have decided to walk with Jesus. I've made Jesus my choice. My mind is made up. My heart has been fixed. That people don't understand how good it is to be wrapped up and tied up and sold up and built up in the grace of Jesus. I tell you what, because when, you, when you're in a, a beggarly state, you're forced, you have no choice but to look and respond to every penny. But as soon as you, res, uh, soon as you relieve from a beggarly state, uh, you no longer have to count pennies because you now live in promise. That's a whole different place. 
Because now you understand uh, that it's not your job that satisfies your condition. Oh, my Jesus. It ain't what the doctor says that satisfies your condition. It's not what people say about you that satisfies your condition. But the blood of Jesus. The Bible said he is rich to all that call upon his name. Oh, you don't understand. I can just call on Jesus. That I don't have a, enough understanding to put all the pennies together. But I can tell you when I didn't know what to do, I could just call on Jesus. And somehow he satisfied the condition. Jesus satisfied the condition. That because he desires, it is his, his good pleasure because that is what he desires, that you are satisfied, that your joy might be full, that you might walk in fullness in him uh, so that people uh, might understand that the joy you receive come from him and no matter what, it remains. Amen. This is what Jesus desires for us. Because that is his desire in his living. These are the things that are, uh, are magnified and manifested in the life of Jesus. That if you walk in him, you can't help but fall into his peace. The Bible said if you just sit there and think about how good he is to you for long enough, you'll find that the God of peace, he shall be with you. <laughs> and he'll give you a peace which passes all understanding. All understanding. That he, uh, this, this other level of living that we find out that you have trouble in the flesh. That's just what happens. That's just what the flesh is. It's a place of trouble, hardship. That's what's in the world. Don't think you got special trouble. Such is common unto man. But God is faithful. Amen. Here's what happens. Uh, you find yourself dealing with trouble and you deal with it until you get to the point where you can let it go. Because you always want a fancy thing. Because everybody wants the answer to trouble. But a life in Jesus is the answer to your trouble. Let me explain it to you because you'll always be dealing with trouble at trouble, but trouble plus trouble equals more trouble. So when you live in trouble, worry about trouble, and try to fix trouble, you find yourself abiding in trouble. But Jesus comes that you might have peace. So here's what happens when we're in trouble, just like the Apostle Paul. When you're in trouble, you start seeking out your trouble. When you're in real trouble, uh, all you prayer warriors don't pray for the uh, 10,000 people who just lost their lives and those families. You ain't praying uh, for the hungry people who live down the street and ain't got no place to stay. You start play, praying for your trouble. The apostle Paul, the Bible said, got a thorn in his flesh, a messenger from Satan sent to buffet him, and there uh, he besought the Lord thrice. Now, this is, this is a, a, at the praying time. He ain't just praying any time. The reason why they say thrice, that means he took three praying times and then prayed the same prayer. So he took three opportunities that he had to pray. He prayed the same prayer. I need this thorn out of my flesh. Then Jesus responded to him, and he said, my grace is sufficient unto thee. This is how he satisfies. This is why Jesus' life is just better. He said, my grace is sufficient unto thee, and my strength is made perfect in your weakness. I ain't got no problem with you living in weakness. I can handle you in your weakness as long as you understand Jesus is your strength. Then Paul, listen to what happens when you, when you get from under those tutors, when you stop living like a beggar, when you quit living like a servant. He didn't beg anymore. But the Bible said he got himself up and said, I realize now that when I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. He then got himself up and said, I can handle some stuff other people can't handle. Because Jesus' yoke is easy. He got up and said, I know how to handle some distresses, some persecutions. All that stuff just come with living. I can handle some sicknesses. I can handle some hardships. Because while I'm handling them, I understand the grace of God. Oh, my Jesus, it's pressed upon me. 
Jesus is with me. Can I tell you something? I'm Jesus, people. I am covered by the blood. The devil don't have any power over me. I've already been bought with the price. I have been sealed with the Holy Ghost until the day of redemption. Jesus, he loves me. And this I do know. And because I'm in love with Jesus, there's some things I do not accept. There's some things I refuse to allow. What I'm saying is I, I don't have to live in degradation ever again. Oh, my Jesus. I wish you would walk with me on this thing. I don't got to live under heaviness ever again. I don't have to live in trouble. Not when Jesus is a bridge. Not when Jesus is a way out of nowhere. The Paul says in Philippians 4, 19, that this is who our God is. He says, He said, but my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Not some, not a little bit, all. You can't work it if you don't know Jesus already gave it. I said all, all your needs. I don't supply my own need. I'm just a branch. Jesus, he's the vine. I don't know how to supply my own need. But Jesus, he specializes. I don't wait till trouble comes around me to then start trying to do something I'm not uh, certified to do. I don't know how to handle need. I know how to follow after Jesus. Jesus knows how to handle need. Jesus knows how to handle it, not some of the time, not part of the time, but all the time. He uses all these all-inclusive things like he can heal everybody, open the door for everybody, find it for everybody, make a way for everybody. That's who Jesus is. For everyone that receives him, that's who he is. For everyone who walks in him, that's who he is. Listen, I'm almost finished, but this is what Jesus declares to us. John 14 and 6, Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, my Jesus. You want to know how good he is? Jesus declares, he tells him, Thomas, you want to know who I am? You want to get to the power? You want to know how to live good? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man coming to the Father but by me. See, maybe you don't understand the power of it until you see that what Jesus is saying there is that whatever you have need of, whatever the problem is, whatever uh, thing need to be fixed, that's who I am. Whatever door need to be opened, that's who I am. Whatever thing need to be turned around, that's who, that's who I am. I'm in all things and above all things and through all things. That I am the door, that I am the keeper, that I am the way maker. All things come through me. All power's in my hand. That he declares to them in terms that they would better understand. But he was telling them, you don't have to look around me. I'm whatever you need. Whenever you need it, however you need it, whenever you need it, I'm able. He was telling Thomas, you ain't got to try to find something else. You found the right one. You ain't got to go on the street begging for help. I am a help. You ain't got to look for a friend. I am a friend. Whatever you have need of. How can we be? the most needy of all people when we call to be the most satisfied of all people. Because we don't understand, we don't understand that when we have met Jesus, that's when everything has to change. That we can't afford to go back because going back was already killing us. Back then wasn't even good back then. There was a man that sat there at a beautiful temple. The Bible said he was a beggar. 
he was laid there, ninth hour, the prayer hour, they were going in to pray. Peter and John seen him. He looked at them, asked for some money, just like beggars do, couldn't help himself. That's what he was there for. People had positioned him there, placed him there. That was his profession. That was what he was uh, called, if you will, to do. He was purposed as a beggar. He wore begging clothes and uh, looked like a beggar, act like a beggar. They placed him in a begging position. He was lame, and so he couldn't help himself. So wherever they placed him, that's where he was. He didn't get to pick and choose. Wherever they put him, wherever people put him, whatever people called him, whatever people gave him, that's what he had to accept. He was a product of being a beggar. Couldn't help himself, so he might cry about it. He might have been crying on the steps that day. He couldn't help it. That's where people placed him. He might not like being a beggar, but that's what people called him. That's who he was. And so there he sat begging in the place people placed him, in the name people called him, waiting for people to help him because he was now just in a weak, beggarly position. Peter and John, the Bible said, fashioned their eyes upon him, seeing that the man wanted money. Then Peter said to the man, I don't have any money for you. He said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And as soon as this man ran into the power of Jesus, he threw off his bag of coat. And the Bible said he ran into church leaping and dancing. Because all he needed was an opportunity. He ran into church shouting and praising. Finally, some of them began to notice. They said, ain't this the same man who was set at the temple gates begging? But since he met Jesus, that's what Peter done. Peter, Peter told him, he said, if there be any good deed done to this impotent man, it wasn't us. But there is something about the name of Jesus. If you see him walking strong and living good, it wasn't us. But what a mighty God we serve. If you see him praising and, and talking right, it wasn't us. But Jesus is rich to everyone who calls on his name. As soon as you meet the power of Jesus, that's where you break out of the begging. As soon as you meet the power of Jesus, that's where you break out of the weakness. The Bible said we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. They say we're weak, but we got Jesus. That we're more than power, powerful through him that loved us. Here's what Paul said. He started talking about this conditioning of life in Jesus. And it's a learning process because the more, I, the more I learn how good Jesus is, the more than I release to his care. The more I learn that he's keeping me when I can't keep myself, the more I can surrender to his mercy. The more I learn about him, the more I don't worry about what people say about him. The more I know Jesus for myself, the less I worry about what people think about me. Having a relationship with Jesus now determines who I am in my life. So Paul says he's now uh, through learning, growing into maturity. Through learning, he now understands some stuff that he ain't got to take, some stuff that he don't have to live in. So he said, now I've learned how to abound, how to be a base. See, the, the, the story of life, everyone wants to tell you that it comes with no uh, trouble. There is trouble in the flesh. There is no trouble in our God. So he said, here's what I learned. I can handle what looks like it's rocky around me to some other people because Jesus lives in me. He said, I know now how to be hungry and to be full. He said, I can go through anything because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He ain't just talking about good stuff. He's saying whatever stuff you think ain't good, I got Jesus and he's always good to me. That not only, uh, that not only does, he, 
does he work it out? But now I'm so convinced, and it may not be all of you that have this same mind of faith, but here's how much I believe Jesus got the power. I believe that he'll find a way. Because sometimes I can't see it. It don't come to me in a vision. I don't hear it in a dream. Nobody speaks it to me prophetically. I just believe because Jesus got all power, he'll find a way. I don't know how we're going to do it. I can't explain to you when he's going to do it. I just know who my God is, and I believe he'll find a way. That we're now understanding Jesus, people called pur uh, purpose for his will, for his glory, uh, that he might be magnified in our living, that we might live according to his word, that we might prove that Jesus is truly the best thing. That Paul says, Romans 8 and 28, and we know all things work together. Yeah. I don't put this stuff together myself. I just know Jesus is able, and somehow he will find a way, and all things work together. You can't love Jesus and go wrong. You can't follow after him, and he not perform his word. Yeah. That it cannot come back void. Yeah. That if you're comfortable living how you're living, here's the problem. There's only one problem with it, that I can't make you and uh, even the word can't just change you. You have to be first tired. If your life to you is good enough in its present state, you'll never let Jesus put his hands on it. If your life to you is satisfactory without his grace over it, then you'll always say this is good enough for me. But when you finally try him, when you finally allow the grace of Jesus over that situation, you'll realize that there is no one like him. You'll realize that he is the very best thing that could ever happen in your life. You'll declare just like we'll declare since I met Jesus, my whole life has changed. That it cannot get better until you declare that it's messed up. What I'm saying is that as long as you're weak and beggarly and you desire to be weak and beggarly, then no one can break you from your desire. If that's what you like, then that's what you have. There's people who like misery. They like anger. They like frustration, degradation. They live that way. They're comfortable that way, and you ain't going to talk them out of it. Because they like to live in that condition, and they're not ready to let it go. There's some stuff that you got to ask yourself, are you really ready to let it go? That you live back and forth struggling with the thing, but are you really ready to let it go? You want to be delivered, but you don't want to release it. Are you really ready to let it go? You want peace, but you don't want to turn it over to Jesus. Are you really ready to let it go? Because you want it, and you want Jesus to fix it while you're holding it, but he cannot fix it until you give it to him. He can't have it until you let it go. And when you let it go, then you become an inactive participant. I mean, it's still happening around you. Uh, but Paul said, I can't feel it. It's still moving around me, but I ain't got the authority to touch it. I turned it over to Jesus. The man with the, summit, with the spirit, he, he just simply told Jesus, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I messed up. I came in here not believing, but uh, uh, forgive me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. And now his son doing the same thing his son was doing. He, he said, I can't touch him. I already released him. I can't do nothing. I already turned him over to Jesus. He said, I don't know, but Jesus, you know whatever you say. Oh, if you want to see the real victory, you ought to release some of this stuff over to Jesus. You ought to take your hands off some things. and uh, You ought to take your hands off the wheel. Quit trying to position yourself. Quit trying to make yourself and just say, Jesus, whatever your will is. Say, well, what I do when it's falling apart? Let it fall in the hands of Jesus. Because I found out he just can't fail. How many times have you thought it was falling apart, but somehow Jesus was able to do some stuff that just blew your mind? How many times you thought uh, it wasn't going to work out, but somehow he made all things work together? And now as you look back and think back, you say, oh, if that hadn't happened, 
I never would have seen what Jesus was really trying to do. If I hadn't let him have that other stuff, I never would have been allowed to receive this new stuff. If I wasn't able to let go of all that past 20 years of worry, I never would have been able to receive this new Jesus peace. When you try him, that's when you'll declare that he is wonderful. He is marvelous. That people have to see the reflection of Jesus in our life, that we've tried him and there is trouble in the world, but I got Jesus. I walk in peace. That there is trouble in the world, but I got Jesus. He gives me joy. That there is trouble in the world, but I got Jesus. I live in victory. And if someone understood that Jesus sustained you at that level, kept you at that level, and let's just get a real about it, blesses you at that level, look how good Jesus has been to you. Every last one of you who went to the hospital walked out. Oh, if you don't understand how good Jesus is to you, I'll say it to you again. I said every last one of you who went in, Jesus has been good to you because somehow he made a way for you to come out. You may not think you got stuff working like other people got stuff working, but Jesus loves you. There are some people right now who wish they could have walked out. But whatever it was that had you, whatever infirmity had bound you, Jesus commanded it to lose his hope and let you go. And I don't care if it's just for one more Sunday, Jesus released you. And that's why he's worthy of the praise. Sometimes we forget and we'll We'll start telling our, our bad story. Well, Bishop, you don't know what I got. I got this problem and that problem. But, and you still alive? And you still giving Jesus the praise? Who wouldn't serve a God like this? You mean to tell me you walking around with condition that people are dying from on a daily basis and you're still alive? Wonderful Jesus. His grace is amazing. You mean to tell me the doctor couldn't fix you, but Jesus still kept you? I know he's worthy. So you're telling me all these things don't work in your body. But because you're walking under his purpose, he makes all things work together. That heart should have gave out, but Jesus started making some stuff work. Oh, my Jesus, he started making some things move that wasn't supposed to move. And that heart that shouldn't start beating started beating anyway. Blood start flowing that should have stopped flowing a long time ago. All things work together. That you are a product of the blessings of the Almighty God. There are some people who can complain, but not you. Jesus has been good to you. Jesus has been good to you. You ought to shout over some people, shout through some people. You're a walking, talking, living miracle. Jesus has been good to you. Here you are living in 2014. They thought you was going to die 10 years ago. Jesus has been good to you. Don't tell me what my God won't do. He's able. You're supposed to talk boldly. The blessing of the Lord maketh rich. You've already found that the Lord God is merciful. His mercy endures forever. You think you got the time to waste one day? 
being degraded and angry. And here it is, you living on grace. His grace is sufficient unto thee. His strength is made perfect in your weakness. It's the grace of Jesus that's sustaining you even right now. Family can't figure it out. Doctors can't figure it out. But Jesus is good. His grace is sufficient. And while they're waiting for something to, bad to happen, Jesus keep on blessing you and blessing you. Not only are you getting better, you're getting stronger. He just keeps on blessing you. David said, the more I follow him, the more goodness and mercy follow me. He just keeps on blessing me. I got to tell you, we've come too far to turn back now. Nobody who put their hand to the plow and looking back is fit. Sometimes, sometimes when I, I get inside my own understanding, it's a dark place in my mind. And sometimes when I get in that place and I'm thinking those thoughts, the thing that brings me back is that I remember who Jesus is in my life. And I simply declare, declare Jesus has been too good in my life. I got to tell you, at that time, I'm not thinking about you. I'm just thinking about how good Jesus is to me. And my Jesus has been too good to me to live like he hasn't satisfied my condition. I mean, sometimes you'll get caught up in some simple stuff. You mean to tell me you serve the almighty God? And you sitting around here worried about a couple dollars? He's been too good to you. Oh, you don't understand I lost my job. But remember last time you didn't have a job? Oh, didn't he satisfy? Didn't he satisfy? Now that's some of them, they ain't going to know what we're talking about. But Jesus, oh, he specializes. He specializes. I found out he's, he works wonders when you don't know what to do. See, the good testimony is the one where I got the whole story, but there's some things where I just got question marks, and then Jesus showed up. I didn't even know how to diagnose the problem, but then Jesus showed up. And he worked it out for me. He fixed it for me. I'm trying to get nearer and closer to Jesus. I'm trying to draw nigh unto the Lord. I'm trying to make him my, my strong tower. You know that when you, when you have it and you just think that's the best way you can live, notice how no, no one can talk you out of it. I find myself trying to convince people that they can have something that's right there in front of them, but when they don't believe it, there's no convincing them. Because in my mind, I can see they have an option, but in their mind, they don't see an option. Of course, they have to live that way because all they can see is the one role, the misery, the anger, the pain. That's all they see. They don't see that Jesus has given them an option. Until one day you try it. And you realize that even though you thought it was all right, Jesus is just better. Life in Jesus is just better. That you get stubborn and I get stubborn just like you. You know, it's hard, to, it's hard to convince me to upgrade because I get so set in on the one I know. And once I know it, I don't want to upgrade because I already got that one mastered. And so if you ask me, I would tell you the one I got is better than the one you got just because I know the one I got. But if I were to try the new thing, I might find out that a new thing is better than the old thing. Just because you've been doing it for 20, 30 years doesn't mean that it is the best thing. Just because you've been living like this all week, all year, uh, the last couple years doesn't mean it's the best thing. Just because it's the way you were taught and the way you were trained don't make it the best thing. Jesus is amazing because you can prove him. 
prove him and see if he will not open up the windows of heaven. He's able. You can try him. If you try him, you'll find out he always works it out. He never fails. He never fails. There's some things where I thought that I had failed in, but I found out Jesus was working some other things together. He has not failed me yet. I say it to you because I want you to hear me say it publicly and openly so you understand. Uh, I'm not whispering this. I ain't writing you a side note that Jesus ain't never failed me. I want you to understand he has never, never, ever, ever, never, ever, ever failed me yet. He has done it. Let us go ahead and be anointed here today. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you in due time. That all you have to do, and it, it, I say all, and I don't mean to belittle it, I mean uh, the one thing that you have to do is let go of the thing that you have. Say, well, I'm worried about it coming. Don't worry about coming back. Uh, don't worry about the repercussion of it. Just release it one time and see what Jesus does. You have to try him. You have to try him. Well, I don't know what he's going to do. Try him and see. Release it one time. Cast your cares upon him. Don't try to figure out what he's going to do with your cares. Just understand Jesus cares for you. Jesus, he loves you. He loves you messed up, broken up, tore up. Jesus loves you. With all the mistakes you made and all the shortcomings you have, Jesus loves you. With the heavy spirit, with the hard spirit, with that disagreeable spirit, Jesus loves you. Loves you. That he didn't wait for you to get yourself together, nor did he wait for you to find righteousness, but in the fullness of time. When Jesus said, that is enough. In due time. That's when Jesus died for you. You ain't got to make it up. He's just easy. You start walking around in these kind of blessings, it might make other people mad, but Jesus is who he is. It is just easy. I don't struggle trying to convince Jesus to bless me. Jesus loves me. I struggle trying to convince myself to stop resisting Jesus' love and just let him have his way. I struggle getting my flesh to stop trying to fight against his peace and just let his peace take over. Jesus, he loves me. And because Jesus loved me, I'm not going to live in misery because Jesus loved me. I don't have to walk in sorrow because Jesus loved me. Pain does not have the right to dominate my living because Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. If ever you need a Jesus in your life, you need him right now. There is no exception for him. There is no other way. There is no other answer. It's going to take Jesus. Only Jesus can satisfy the need that you have in your life. Let me tell you something about him. He doesn't need for you to be right or righteous. You ain't got to be holy. You ain't got to try to get yourself together. He can handle you when you're falling all apart. He can take you while you're dirty, while you're overcome, while you're weak. Believe me, you ain't got to love him to meet him, but if you meet him, you will love him. Jesus is able. He's able. He doesn't need for you to get yourself together. That's why he died for you. You can come to him just like you are. He hasn't saved one righteous person yet. But Jesus saves sinners. And Jesus still saves. And there is still room at the cross. He has not turned anyone away. The blood is still flowing. And all you got to do is try him. You ain't got to try to predict what you're going to do next and tomorrow. Just try Jesus today. 
If you try him, you'll find out he's a good shepherd. He knows how to lead and guide you. You didn't know from the day you confessed Jesus you would be here, but somehow Jesus has been moving in your life, and he's able. I want to give to you this call of salvation, confess to you that Jesus did come down the flesh over 2,000 years ago, that he suffered, bled, died on the cross, that he went down the grave, he stayed there three days and three nights. On the third day, Jesus rose again with all power in heaven and in earth. If you believe that with all of your heart, repent of your sins and confess with your mouth that Jesus, he did rise again, you shall be saved. The Bible said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If there's anyone here today and you need Jesus, I encourage you, just try him one time. If you need him, I encourage you, don't let anyone stop you. Uh, don't let what you think you used to know. You need to have the real Jesus in your life right now. I mean the real Jesus. I don't want a storybook. I don't want no cartoon character. You can have your movies. I need the real Jesus living on the inside of me. I need a God who's ever present, the one who never fails, the beginning and the ending. I encourage you not to miss the opportunity to make Jesus your choice. The Jesus, he is the captain of your salvation. Therefore, no one dictates to him what he will do with him. All you do is say, Jesus, whatever you want to do. If you let him have his way, you'll find out he is wise. And he knows exactly what you have need of. Is there anyone need Jesus? The door of salvation is open. Now would be your time, Jesus. He is your answer. My testimony is saturated in this one thing. Since I met Jesus. Since I met Jesus. That's what made the difference. That's, that's the difference in me since I met Jesus. Not a book I read or a story I was told. Since I met Jesus. Since I was washed in his blood. Since since he uh, made in me a new creation since I met Jesus, my whole life has changed. He made the difference. And every good thing, every wonderful thing, every blessing, every door, it's all because of Jesus. For without him, I can do nothing. I'll give you just one more moment. If you need Jesus, I would encourage you to not let anyone stop you or block you or eye rolling or talking or whatever it is that would discourage you from finding this grace that is in our God because if ever you make it to Jesus he is the best thing are there any witnesses in here if ever you just can make it Jesus is the best thing that ever happened in my life if I had known then what I know now I would have did backflips somersaults cartwheels he is the best thing. Every day with him, it just gets sweeter and better. I know it looks like the world is going down, but Jesus is still coming up. He's wonderful. He is amazing. It's Jesus time. I'm asking all of those who believe Jesus that you believe him with me today. That our God is God that he remains in full control, that he has uh, effectual working power, that he still is the same, that there is someone today who needs to know that Jesus is their deliverer, even in the midnight hour, even in the desert season, even in the feebleness and weakness of their mind, Jesus is able to touch them. And I want you to believe with me, even right now, he's moving. That even right now, he's able to touch them and deliver them from whatever it is that's holding them captive. Even right now, Jesus is able to set them free. Even right now, he's able to bring restoration to their mind and peace to their understanding. Even right now, Jesus is able to deliver them out of whatever it is that has them bound. And we believe he's doing it right now in the name of Jesus. If you would, I want you to believe with me that Jesus, he is a healer of all sickness, all pain, all disease. He's already paid the price. That he does not have to struggle or work with or work for trying to make a healing. The blood has already been shed. By his stripes, we are healed. That there are some that are going through sickness, suffering, and pain. There are some even right now who are under the Dr. Carroll. The doctor has released 
But we believe that right now Jesus is the only healer, that Dr. Jesus has the final word. And therefore, we plead the blood of Jesus over their infirmity, their pain, their sickness, every schism in the body. Everything is not working according to his will. We declare even right now that Jesus is healing them in the name of Jesus. I ask if you would believe with me that Jesus, he's the Savior. Oh, my Jesus, this is, this is where you really, can, you really can tie your faith on to this one. He can save anybody, anybody. That we're not looking for exceptional people. We're not looking for great and wonderful people, just people who need Jesus. And there's a whole lot of people who need Jesus. And we believe that Jesus specializes in saving the people that need him. And we believe that right now that someone is receiving visitation from our Lord and Savior. That even right now where they're at, whatever they're in, whatever they're engaged in, Jesus is showing up. They're seeing the sacrifice that our Savior made, the blood that covered him from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet, those hands, those wounds in his hands and feet, that crown of thorn that was played on his head. They're seeing that Jesus loved them enough to die in their stead. And somebody this very hour is being baptized in the blood of Jesus. They're being washed in the blood. They're being born again. Their sins are being washed. Their transgressions are being forgiven. Their iniquities are being remitted. Somebody is putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're calling him Lord. They're calling him the Savior. They're declaring right now that there is no one like the lowly Jesus. They're declaring right now that Jesus is the best thing that ever happened in their life. If you believe with me today that Jesus is healing and saving and delivering, somebody shout out, thank you, Jesus. See, times are not that hard. I'm still a believer. I still believe that Jesus' word cannot come back void. I still believe that he'll do everything he said. I still believe that his name is above every other name. And that at the mention of the name of Jesus, stuff got to move out the way. Conditions got to change. And Jesus, his will will be done. If anybody has a heart to give, raise your hands, allow the deacons to come find you. And we thank Jesus for you in advance. Remember, as always, only what you do for Jesus is going to last. Say, well, I've been trying to get better. Well, stop trying to get better. Try Jesus. He is the best. If you could get better on your own, Jesus wouldn't have to have to pay so much. I'm trying to live better. You can't live better. You live in the best you can. You don't give Jesus a better life to fix. You give him that same raggedy one you've been living and let him fix that one. And he'll prove to you that he can handle that life. He can deal with you with that condition. He can handle you in that situation. Jesus doesn't need the storm to stop for him to be Lord of the storm. He can just speak the word. And the wind and the wave must obey his voice. He can just speak the word. And everything that's been trying to harass you. Got to take flight the other direction. He can just speak the word. And victory already belongs to you. At the name of Jesus, the devil has to flee. He can just speak the word. And the situation is already settled. If Jesus says it, it's already done. It's already done. I was con content to look for a miracle, but I'm no longer looking for a miracle. I am a living miracle. The next time that someone is looking for one, they can look at you and realize that our God is able to do what no other power can do. The Bible said that even young men shall utterly faint. This fainting thing is, is, is pervasive. It's powerful. It's something that happens all the time. People are just giving up and I, I made up my mind I can't afford to give up. Jesus has brought me too far. That doesn't mean I don't feel like giving up. I just can't afford to give up. Giving up would be too costly. And Jesus has been too good. And if if today you just feel like giving up, I want you, if you would, uh, come to the altar.
See, only those who lack wisdom would act like somehow that's something that's a, away from them. The, the Bible said even young men, shortly faint, everybody feels like giving up, but they that wait on the Lord, he shall renew their strength. That's what I'm after. I'm after that thing that only Jesus can do. I need my strength to be renewed. I need Jesus to touch me in my weakness. I need Jesus to fix it for me. See, I can't afford to give up right here. Because when I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. I need him to make all grace abound toward me. Then I can have sufficiency in all things. With Jesus, I can't make it. That's how people are. They want to make you feel bad because you feel like giving up. Feel like giving up is better than giving up. The Bible said I would have fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I almost gave up. But then I remembered how good Jesus is to me. My life is in Jesus. As soon as I remembered how good Jesus is to me, now I believe I'll make it. I felt like giving up. I, I feel a little weakness, but I, I believe I'll make it. Stuff ain't happening like I wanted to happen, but I know Jesus, he, he's still moving. I believe I'll make it. I believe I'll make it. He that has begun a good work will perform it until that day. I believe I'll make it in the name of Jesus. I got some expectations. So I don't understand. I'm just ready to give up. Jesus was ready to give up. But then he moved into this other level of living. I'm after something else. My flesh always want to give up. But greater is he that's in me. The Bible said a just man falls seven times. But every time he gets back up again. I'm not trying to tell you I ain't got no problem. I'm just trying to tell you I'm going to be with Jesus. Paul said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind. All that stuff that happened yesterday, I'm releasing that. Jesus told, he told Peter, when you convert it, strengthen the brethren. As soon as you change your mind, you make sure you tell somebody else, you ain't gonna live like that. Not with how much Jesus loves you. You don't have to go through that. Jesus paid the price.
You gotta try refusing some things. Even better yet, why don't you try rebuking a few things? I refuse to live in misery, not today. I'm not going to let you steal my joy today. In the name of Jesus, you can't take my peace today. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me. I'm anointed to be able to handle some stuff. I don't live life by myself. I'm not a special person. I just serve a special God. Who was beaten, bruised, and wounded for me. I don't deserve it, but Jesus loves me anyway. I can't even tell you why he chose me, but I'm glad he did. Sometimes it's good just to let it go. The song says, I feel better. So much better. Since I laid my burdens down. have to be the problem solver. You can turn it over to Jesus. You can turn it over to Jesus. Let me give you the scripture. The Bible says that you can come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace to help in your time of need. You can turn it over to Jesus. You can actually bring him the problem. Even when you are the problem. You can come to him when you're guilty. and still come boldly to the throne of grace. And get you some mercy. And find you some grace. Just when you need it most.
People need to understand just how blessed you are. The blessing is not in what you have, but in who you with. I'm with Jesus. I know I've been blessed. Jesus loves me. I know I've been blessed. That we have a relationship even right now where I can just call on the name of Jesus. I don't have to go to anybody to get to him. I can call him for myself. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If people could actually see uh, manifested in your living how blessed you really were, it would blow their mind. A man told me once, he said, I'm so blessed I can't even put it into words. I, you, can't, you can't signify my blessing by where I live or what I, I'm so blessed. Jesus has been so good. You ought to make it your personal mission. To show the world just how good Jesus is to you. Jesus is good. Jesus is good. Yes, he is. 